everyone. We are gonna start. Okay, thank you. So, welcome everyone to the 33rd annual Goldschmidt Conference. My name is Catherine Jambel, and here is Carmen Sanchez Valle. We are the co-chairs of the organizing and science committees of this conference. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we are very excited and pleased to welcome you here, whether you are attending in this beautiful city of Lyon or attending remotely around the world. Altogether, you are more than 500 attendees, which shows the growing success of the geochemistry. I may add that this growth is particularly impressive for both environmental and marine geochemistry, which of course delights the oceanographer in me. However, we didn't prepare this meeting alone, and we wish to thank our colleagues of the organizing and science committees who did a very hard job. The Geochemical Society, the staff from GPDL, in other words, Adriana and our friends from Quebec. The staff of CONFEX, 47 SIM chairs, almost 500 conveners, 45 uh, student helpers, they are here, almost 200 mentors, and our exhibitors and sponsors. And last but not least, our wonderful and exceptional EAG staff, Marie-Aude and Alice. Oh, nice. So we want to make this meeting a welcoming and safe and inclusive for all participants. And we want to encourage open and respectful dialogue. Since 2018, the Geochemical Society and the European Association of Geochemistry has adopted a code of conduct and create the AMIGO program. AMIGO stands for a more inclusive Goldschmidt. And if you experience any inappropriate behavior or you witness any inappropriate behavior, you can always uh, report to the help desk or contact any person wearing a yellow ribbon in their badge. Um, to make Goldschmidt also a more accessible and inclusive conference, the European Association of Geochemistry and the Geochemical Society have decided to provide uh, open remote or free remote access to all participants for low and income, uh, low income countries. We also have uh, provided a number of grants for attendees from, or delegates from these countries to participate in person in the meeting. Last year, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committees of the European Association of Geochemistry and the Geochemical Society conducted a global community survey, and you can be able to find the results, summarize it in a poster that is displayed on the DI booth uh, located in the exhibitor hall. We also wish to highlight something new for this year's Goldschmidt Conference. You will notice that our present poster presenters were invited to submit poster teasers. The short videos are on displays on TV screens and in the exhibit and poster hall. And we really invite you to watch them. Some of them are very creative and very funny. They are also available on the website and app on the poster session pages. We thank you again, all of you, for taking part in this Goldschmidt conference, and we really wish you all a wonderful week. The success of this Goldschmidt will be your success. It's now my pleasure to invite Catherine Chauvel, the president of the European Association of Geochemistry. Here she is. Thank you. Have a good week. Okay, everybody. Um, yeah. So, as uh, Catherine said, I'm Catherine Chauvel. I'm the president of the European Association of Geochemistry. Um, so, uh, the recognition 
of scientific excellence is at the core of our society's mission. However, recognizing deserving scientists first requires that somebody invest a little bit of time in raising a nomination. That's what our award nomination committee has done and they did a remarkable job because the number of nominations has significantly increased. However, we still crucially miss nomination from the community. In other words, from all of you. So I strongly encourage you to be part of the effort and submit a nomination for the next awards. On the slide, you have the deadline for uh, the nomination of the uh, Geochemistry Fellows, 31st of October, and for the European Association of Geochemistry Awards, the URA Award, the Science Innovation Award, and the Hootemans Award, the deadline is mid-November. I count on you. So now we have several medals to present for this year, and due to the pandemic, we also have medals to present from the past, for the past year, so I will be presenting some of the medals today and others tomorrow, because it's just too many people. Today I will start with our highest award, the Harold Hure Award, recognizing scientific excellence as well as the broader impacts candidates have made in their career to date. Here we go. So I'm very honored to present the 2023 Euro Award to Bo Barken Jürgensen from the Aris University in Denmark. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Sorry. It's I have to introduce him before he comes in. So, <laughs> uh, so Bob, Bo, Bo Jorgensen is a world-renowned microbial ecologist whose impact on biogeochemistry and, bi and geobiology has been revolutionary. Through novel methodology and careful experiments and observations, Bo has revealed how microbes inhabiting marine waters and sediments both respond to and control their chemical environment. Through his human qualities, Bose has also been a tremendous source of inspiration to his many students and colleagues. So Bo, you can now come on the stage and join me. <laughs> Okay, so now I, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Sumit Chakraborty, the president of the Geochemical Society, to come on the stage. Sumit? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, very good morning and welcome from me as well. Um, it is my pleasure as the president of the Geochemical Society to uh, offer our highest honor, the Victor Moritz Goldschmidt Award, named after the scientist who's considered the father of our science for his work on um, meteorites and uh, laying the basis of modern geochemistry. Um, the award is presented annually for achievements in geochemistry over a career. This year we recognize the remarkable achievements of Roberta Radnick of the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, Roberta receives this honor for her contributions to understanding the composition, the origin and evolution of the continents and the lithospheric mantle, and her role in developing lithium isotope geochemistry. By combining geochemistry, petrology, geophysics, and field observations over the past 35 years, she has tremendously influenced and contributed to our knowledge of the continental lithosphere and how these interact with other reservoirs. Uh, in addition to her many scientific accomplishments, Roberta has also made a big mark in our community through her service as a mentor, her um, advocation for a diversity, equity, and inclusion, 
and as president of the Geochemical Society between 2018 and 19. It seems particularly fitting that uh, she receives this award named after Goldschmidt because uh, she's scientifically speaking an academic granddaughter of Goldschmidt, uh, tracing her lineage through her advisor Ross Taylor, through Brian Mason, directly to Victor Goldschmidt. And if I may add a personal note, I personally have tremendously benefited from her work on continental crust and showing me how the Geochemical Society works. So it's a particular pleasure that the board and the award committee has given me the opportunity to recognize her on the stage. Welcome, Roberta. And then I ask Catherine back on the stage, please. Okay, so now I would like to introduce uh, today's plenary speaker, <coughs> Larry Minot. Um, scientifically speaking, Larry Minot is an economy geologist interested in the way mineral deposits form, and in fact, is much more than that. Larry had a rather non-linear career, starting with 30 years of in academia, where he became the expert of gold deposits in SCARDS. It was followed by more managerial positions, one as a congressional fellow at the American Congress during the Obama administration, and the other as deputy associate director for energy and mineral resources at the USGS. Larry Minot has trained lots of students and published numerous articles in the field of economic geology and geochemistry, but his passion is for a different field, it's growing wine. Today, Larry Minot will tell us all about the science of good taste, the intersection of wine, geology, and geochemistry. Please welcome Professor Larry Minot. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about my favorite subject of all time, great wine. And for those of you who would like to attend the laboratory part of this course, we'll be meeting at various restaurants around Lyon, and anybody who wants to bring me there and buy me a nice bottle of wine, I'm ready. I should also point out that I actually have a historical connection to Goldschmidt, because he did some of the very earliest studies on scarn deposits. Okay, which I could also talk about for several hours here, but I will limit myself just to wine. Uh, for those who are interested in more details about some of the things I'll discuss today, uh, there are two publications that you're probably familiar with. Uh, one, there was a special issue of Elements on terroir that goes into a lot of the details about viticulture and winemaking that I won't go into as much detail today. And then another one by in geochemical perspectives that talked about a life well spent or maybe misspent that goes through uh, different aspects of my career, including a whole chapter on wine. Mm -hmm. So I like to start with a simple thought experiment. Imagine two separate vineyards right next to each other, okay? And they clearly have the same amount of sunshine, the same temperature, the same rainfall, everything else is very similar. And if we assume they have the same uh, grape varieties and winemaking technique, and yet they produce dramatically different wines. And so as scientists, we are called upon to ask that question, why? So that's part of what I do with my career. And we, we summarize this under the term terroir, because many people like to simplify this to say, it's the water, it's the limestone, it's something. And all those things might play a part but it's really the integration of all those factors. And what I'll try to describe today is how some of those things affect the making of great wine. Because it really comes down to the quality of the grapes. 
any winemaker will tell you, just like any chef will tell you, it's all about the quality of the ingredients. If you give a, a chef two-week-old fish that's rotten, what can you do? Okay, the same is true for, for the vineyards. So as a winemaker, the quality of the grapes is really important. And so what makes for high-quality grapes? Well, we obviously need a permissive climate. Okay, we're not going to have good grapevines in the Sahara Desert or the Amazon rainforest or the polar ice caps. So we need permissive climate and temperature. But that's definitely not enough. And then we need things like uh, water and nutrients. But here's the really important thing. Water is the most important thing, not only for human life, but for grapevines. And when that water occurs is really important. Water at the wrong time can ruin entire harvest. Wind at the wrong time can ruin mud break. So all these things come together and we get back to our question, why are these two different vineyards different? So I'm going to illustrate that with examples from four places around the world, Washington State and California and the US, Bordeaux and France, and then from the Southern Hemisphere, Chile and New Zealand. So let me start with Washington. Uh, it's an area I know quite well. And there are four main factors that we need to consider. Climate, volcanoes, glaciers, and soils. And most people, when I give this talk, they go, okay, I understand the climate and the soil stuff, but volcanoes and glaciers? What the hell does that have to do with good wine? And as a professor, I would respond, I'm glad you asked that question because we're going to spend the next six hours, well, I guess 40 minutes, talking about exactly why these things have the effect that they do. This is how most of the world views the climate on the, the left side of this diagram in western Washington. Um, it's very rainy, vegetation grows everywhere, and on the eastern side of the state, it's vastly different. It's a desert, it's very dry, so the grapevines have much different access to, to water, and that plays out where the location of the vineyards. So in the center part of this, and on the right side, is the Appalachian for what they call the Columbia Valley, and I'll explain why it is where it is. But if you look at this map, you can easily see one of the effects on climate, and that is the north-south range of volcanoes that make up the Cascade Mountains. Okay, and if you fly into Seattle, one of the things you'll see on a clear day, which in case you missed it, it's very rainy there, so there aren't too many clear days, but when it is, you see Mount Rainier, beautiful, a stratovolcano, and as volcanoes are wont to do, periodically they erupt. This is Mount St. Helens erupting in 1980, and it spread ash across most of the state. And because it was a fairly major eruption, the ash made it up and encircled the globe. So in the northern hemisphere, there's a little bit of Washington State ash in every vineyard in France, in Spain, in Germany, in Italy. So it's actually a true geochemical statement that a little bit of Washington terroir is in every vineyard in France and Spain and all these other countries. I try not to make a big point of this when I'm visiting those vineyards because they might think I'm implying something else, which I am not. It makes no effect whatsoever, don't get me wrong, either in Washington State or anywhere else. But it's those little geologic tidbits that are nice to know. Okay, the other thing you can see by looking at this map, if you have a trained scientific eye, is the effect of glaciers. Now, some of you are going, oh my, is this going to be on the quiz? Because I'm not recognizing the glaciers. Well, we need to go back in time a little bit. This is what the world looked like 15,000 years ago during the glacial maximum. All of Canada was covered by a very large ice sheet with major lobes coming down into the U.S. And if we blow up the area in what we call the Pacific Northwest, we can see big lobes of ice coming down um, across the border. And these had a fundamental effect upon the terroir, where you might be able to grow grapes. Okay? And the glaciers do two major things we need to think about. The first is that they carry very large amounts of material. Okay? Again, this is fairly common knowledge. You have medial moraines and lateral moraines and all this stuff being carried down by the glaciers due to the extensive erosion. And glaciers can carry things like this, which no amount of wind or rivers can transport. So having these very large boulders allows us to actually track where glaciers were when they are no longer there. Because the only way you can get boulders like this is by transporting them by ice. And of course, geologists like to ride them as they go down the, the glacier. The other effect of the glaciers, besides carrying large amounts of material, is that they disrupt drainage patterns. And so here, the major lobes came down. They occupied all of what's called Puget Sound, where Seattle is. But they also blocked some of the major river drainages, particularly on the eastern side of this, where they blocked up the Clark Fork River, forming a large lake that covered the western half of the state of Montana. 
Okay? This is a very large lake, larger than all the fresh water in the world right now. And as the lake got bigger and bigger, or deeper and deeper, the fundamental physics comes in, ice, water, you've all had a cocktail, you know what that ice does, it floats. So eventually the ice dam burst and racing across the state is now all this water, which we can calculate is about 10 times the volume of all the world's rivers put together at once, rushing across the state of Washington out to the Columbia River and out into the Pacific. And we actually see effects of this all the way across the other side of the Pacific um, in Japan. If we look at an aerial photograph, we can see very clear evidence of this, even though there's, there's no water, there's no glacial ice or snow in, in Washington right now, but you can see the various channels that these waters have cut through there, and I put little yellow arrows so you can see exactly where they were, and when they, they do that, they carry away everything, all the topsoil, they actually erode down into the bedrock, and so they're removing and moving around a tremendous amount of material. This is an artist's conception of what one of those things looks like. And again, the amount of water rushing through this is, is hard for the human mind to imagine. And when you see this in the ground, you see things that you're not quite sure what, what they mean. You really have to go up in an airplane or even to a satellite to, to see them. For example, these are giant ripple marks. Okay? They have crests of several hundred meters high, lengths of kilometers, and we can calculate the amount of water that rushed through there. So in this particular channel, this is more water than the entire Amazon in this one little channel. So the amount of water moving through here is very, very fast. And all of it is rushing down to the Columbia River and out to the Pacific. It had to go through things like this. This is called Wallula Gap, cut into the Columbia River basalts by the Columbia River. And all that water got backed up behind that, forming a huge, what we call, temporary lake. Okay? Okay. It wasn't a dam. The water could keep moving through that gap, but it backed up the water covering a fairly large area. And when that water gets backed up, it slows down. Okay? So using fundamental hydrodynamics, you know what happens. All that sediment that's being carried by this water is then dropped out. So these are what we call slack water deposits. Okay, the water slowed down, we call it slack water. And so it deposited basically mud sand, silt, gravel, and depending how fast the water is moving, and I'll show you later, really fast, big blocks, over this entire area. Okay. Okay. This is what it looks like if you cut through it. In fact, that's exactly what happened here. This is Burlingame Canyon, and an agricultural irrigation ditch got left open Friday night when somebody was rushing off to the bar, and when they came back Monday morning, the drainage ditch had cut through all of these sediments, because these are unconsolidated, sediments that were deposited, again, over the last 10, 15,000 years. And each one of those layers represents a different flood. Now you're probably thinking, wait a second, I got the mental picture of that flood, but now you're saying, oh, I can count 10, 20, 30 different floods? So think about what happened. The ice slope came down, blocked up the river, backed up this huge lake. Eventually, when the lake was deep enough, and we're talking about 500 to 1,000 meters of water, the ice dam broke, water rushed across, stripping everything, moving all the sediment around. Then what happened? Glacier kept on flowing, blocked it up again. So this happened over and over again. So each one of these layers represents one of those slack water deposits from one of these floods. Okay. Next, the sun came out after one of these floods, and all this mud, which is now lying across the entire terrain, gets whipped up by the wind. So huge sandstorms redeposit this. So you have basically a sheet sand dune, we call this less deposited over the top of it. So the substrate for all the vineyard areas is these slack water sediments overlain by the wind-blown lust, and depending on which vineyard you're looking at, the roots might be in one or the other. So coming back to the map of the Appalachian, this looks very much like that first image I showed you of all the glacial streams going across the state, because all of the vineyards are on this glacial material. And I do consulting for, for vineyard siting with some people and let's see if I can get the laser button, which I am not seeing. Can you see the cursor? No. Nope. Okay, well, anyway, <coughs> that area that represents the Appalachian, if you go outside of it 10 meters, you're no longer on the glacial deposits. And so you can grow grapes, in some cases very, very good grapes within it, but 10 meters out, you can't. So this is the essence of terroir and part of the answer to that first thought question I gave you. 
two adjacent vineyards, one's great and one's not so great. This is an example where you can put your finger on the boundary between those two. If we look in more detail at the Walla Walla Appalachian, which is the little dark brown thing down at the bottom of this, um, within that, there are dozens of different vineyards, the little black squares, and each one is on a different substrate. So we can start asking the question, well, what difference does it make whether it's the really coarse grain stuff carried by fast water flows or the finer grain stuff? And it's pretty easy to see this in the field. So in the background is the Pepperbridge Vineyard, a really, really nice vineyard, produces great wine. And then between that and the vineyard we're standing in is a floodplain of totally different sediments where you can't grow grapes at all. What they grow there are onions. They're actually very famous. They're called Walla Walla Sweets. Great tasting onions, but not quite good wine stuff. So if we go into that vineyard, this is what vineyards look like. Carefully trained, very nice, small canopy management. And if we cross one of those lines for the geologic materials that they're growing in, the vineyard on the same day looks really different. We're looking right down the rows and you can see that all the vines are growing together. So the simple thing that's going on here, this is plant physiology. If grape vines have uninterrupted access to water and nutrients, they will produce much more foliage, leaves, and put their energy into growing more leaves, okay, not into properly ripening the grapes. So you need either artificially or naturally to be able to control the amount of water and nutrients that the grapevine has access to so you can optimally ripen those grapes. So this is just a visual example of what a good vineyard looks like versus a not so good vineyard. And after we did this study and explained it to the, the, the company, they pulled all this out and they planted barley instead. If we look within these various sub appellations, you see things like this. This is the Caillou vineyard. And I, I like to say that good vineyards, the grapes should suffer a little bit because we don't want them to grow lots of leaves. And so this is what suffering looks like. And if we do a, a cut through this, we can see that the roots are going down and there's rocks all the way down to the mantle, to the core, not that far, but <laughs> lots of rocks. And so this is somewhat anti-intuitive for many people because they like to think of, oh, nice rich soil, we get nice great vineyards. Nope. If you want to grow table grapes, then sure, that's fine because then having nice big grapes that have no taste but are big and watery, that works. But if you want good wine grapes, they're going to be smaller and concentrate the flavor. And if we had another five hours, I could talk about how you, you make great wine from that. But for now, let's look at one more example. And this is Red Mountain, the tiniest little Appalachian. It's a little red dot right in the center of this. And the reason why I'm going to show you this one is that's right in the middle of the floods coming through there. So Red Mountain is actually a mountain. It's that diagonal thing cutting through this. And if we look at the, the vineyards, this is a color infrared photo draped over the topography. You can see various red things, which is vegetation, and then the green things, which is not vegetation. Um, individual vineyards are really different relative to the peak of that mountain. And the reason why they have this distribution is that here's my tremendous artistic ability is flexing their muscles. Here comes the flood around uh, Red Mountain and it never overtopped the mountain, okay, which would have been a really good standing wave. If you were a surfer, it would have been a great place. You stand on top of the mountain, you wax up your surfboard, and you see the water coming, and you start paddling, and you go all the way to Japan on that wave without any problem. However, what the waves did is that they formed these huge back eddies behind the mountain where all the vineyards are, and I've shown these big black blobs, that's where rafted boulders got dropped. So as the water slows down, something that was big enough being carried in a big iceberg and big blocks can be dropped out. And so we can actually map out exactly where these floods went in the vineyard. Okay, this is what it looks like if we stand back. So the arrows are pointing at uh, glacial erratics. And from this distance, they look pretty small. But here's one a little bit closer. And you can see this nice white marble there is no marble outcrop within a thousand kilometers of this spot. This was carried by the glaciers from Canada, came down, and of course this particular block is not important for the vineyards, but this whole glacial process is really critical for explaining why things are the way they are. If we go into more detail, we can look at a cut through here and see different lenses of gravel. Can you imagine this water swirling around? And so you can almost look at the terroir of every single vineyard, every single vine within that vineyard 
And we're actually starting to develop some of the technology to be able to monitor individual vines in terms of water status and other things. But imagine the roots going down and one plant gets into the relatively fine grained lust, the wind blown sand. Another one that could be right next to it is rooting down there in that course of gravel. And why is that important? Because it controls the access to moisture and how water moves around. To map this out, we dig little holes and we map out the entire subsurface in the vineyard. So this is just a schematic uh, sampling of those various things where we're documenting what the grain size, the amount of bedrock versus the soils that are developed in there. And we use those different things to map out within the vineyards. So now we're looking at individual vineyards, that black square. That's the Silijal Vineyard. It's one of the most famous vineyards in Red Mountain. Produces wine that's much more expensive than I can afford to drink. But if anybody wants to go take me out to dinner there, I'd be happy to show you where it is. And you can see those different things, the different colors, the, the hazel, the scutiné, and the warden uh, soils. And those soils are defined by that profile I just showed you. So what the sand and gravel looks like in the subsurface. And here we could do a really interesting experiment. We were able to look at a single row of vines. So this happened to be Cabernet Sauvignon, because it's my favorite grape. And we looked at what kind of wine can we produce from the hazel, that's the red, the warden, the yellow, and the scutiny, which is the, the greenish color. And the same row of grapes, same climate, same sunshine, same rainfall, everything's the same. And in this case, we controlled the winemaking. We did this in experimental winery. So everything was absolutely the same, and we didn't have to worry about changes in yeast and oak barrels and everything else that would affect wine. And the simple question I always ask people when they just taste this, scientifically we were doing blind tastings, but is, are these wines the same or are they different? And everybody who does this says, well, yeah, they're really different. And then when I explain all of this geology background, which you now have in your head, they go, oh, so maybe that's why this one is different than that one. And I go, bingo, you passed the test. Okay, so this is what it looks like in the field. This is one of those parts of the vineyard on one soil horizon, and we step across that line, and now it looks different. And what's the difference? You can see the green, both in the cover grass and the beginning of the, the vigor of the grapevines. Now, you can control that by trimming it back, okay? but this is the sort of difference we're seeing. This is what I call the terroir effect. Okay? And let me be very clear. There is no magical terroir. Okay? When I show you pictures of gravel, gravel by itself is not necessarily good or bad. What it does is that it affects the distribution and the timing of moisture and nutrients to the plants. So it all comes down to what's going on with the plants. So let's jump over to California to see the influence of tectonics, alluvial fans, and slope. Okay. You're probably familiar with the overall plate geometry of the Pacific and North America sliding past each other by the San Andreas Fault in California. It's a fairly famous fault. And you can see the clear evidence of the, the lines of the faults moving through here. And in Napa County, outlined there in the yellow, um, it's, these are fault-bounded slivers, these are peripheral faults off the San Andreas. And because of the active uplift of the various blocks, the valley, Napa Valley, is filled full of alluvial fans coming down off the slopes. And alluvial fans have a very predictable prediction from relatively coarse grain near the apex, where the stream is coming out of the uplifted mountain, and it gets finer as it moves out into the valley. So here, in this complicated diagram, in the cross section, you can see different colors referring to different parts of the fan. Just simplify that as, as grain size. And on the top, you can see the actual vineyards. So imagine that you are a real estate agent, and you're being hired by one of the Silicon Valley billionaires. I won't mention any of them by name, but you know who they are. And they say, oh, I've got more money than cents. Now you know who they are. And I want to buy a vineyard you know, to make a great wine and put my name on it and I can have my ego just out there on the label. You know, we might call it the minor winery, but unfortunately I don't have a billion dollars. And so as the real estate agent, you might say, oh, well here's one that's right next to this very famous winery. And you look at it in this map, I wish I could get the darn pointer to work, but I don't see any way to do that. If anybody knows how to get the pointer to work, maybe if I go over here to this thing that looks like a pointer, it'll do something. Ooh, look at that. Laser pointer. Whoa, there we go. Okay, so let's imagine that this is a really famous winery and I'm taking Elon Musk, oops, I shouldn't mention names. I'm taking some famous rich person and I say, oh, I've got this great property right next to it over here. 
And that person says, oh, good. They pay a million dollars a hectare or whatever it might cost. And you can see where this is going. That's going to be really different than the other one because of its position within the fan. So to, to play this out in real time, this is one of the most famous uh, sort of marriages of the Mondavi family in the US, undoubtedly the most famous winemaking family, and the Rothschild family from France, also reasonably well known. They got together, pooled resources, and put together a real high-end winery here. And they brought in French terroir experts who are doing exactly what I'm describing now. They said, oh, here's the alluvial fan. Here's the apex. Here's where this certain grain size occurs. Here's the magic part where we want to be. And that's where they put it. So let's jump across the pond to another place in France, Bordeaux. Apparently, they make wine there. So let's talk about that for a moment. The influence of glaciation again. Oh, you're going, wait a second. I didn't see any glaciers when I went to Bordeaux. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. So the Pyrenees and Massif Central all were glaciated. So on a nice summer day, it looks beautiful, green, livestock running around. But once again, the glacial maximum. Okay, not only do we have a huge ice sheet further north, but we had ice caps in the Pyrenees and the Massif Central, and all those provided all the sediment that I was describing for Washington State, rushing down um, to the estuary, which separates Bordeaux, and form huge gravel lenses along both sides of the estuary. And you have lots of very famous sub-appellations there. The one I like to point out is Graves, because obviously in French that means gravel, and it's there because it's situated on a particular gravel horizon, the Gunz Gravel Terrace, and all of the first growths, all the premier career, are on particular gravel lenses. It's really important what it's growing on. Now, I'm not saying that having gravel by itself gives you great wine. That's not where I'm going. I'm just saying that's one of the things that affects the control of moisture and precipitation. And in general, there's much more precipitation in Bordeaux than there is, say, in Washington State. So it becomes really important to be able to control that moisture. This is what the Gunz gravel looks like on the left, that thing, and grapes growing in that gravel. It's so kind of similar to what I was showing you in Washington State. Keep this in mind, I'm going to show you other things that look very similar to it. Let's jump down to the southern hemisphere where we can look at the influence of tectonics, oceanography, and slope. Now you're wanting oceanography. How the hell is he going to connect that to wine? I sort of got the volcanoes, I maybe believe the glaciers, but oceanography? Eh, how's that work? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. So we have the upwelling Antarctic and Humboldt currents coming up. So we have cold, nutrient-rich water coming off, which is why it also um, has the support for one of the world's great ecosystems, the whales and everything else. But that cold water upwelling, because the prevailing wind is coming across the ocean, it goes across that cold water, and it rains. It's raining almost all the time out there, eh, somewhere between 10 and 50 kilometers off the coast. And once that rain has been dropped out, you then enter some of the driest territory in the world. The Atacama Desert, where it rains on average about every 75 years, is there because of this rain effect. So when I talked about a rain shower in Washington State, the rain shadow is caused by the volcanoes, okay, the Cascade Range. Here, it's caused by the cold upwelling currents, but the effect is the same. We now have a very dry area, and the other big effect is that we have winds coming down off the Andes and Obviously up there, we've got glaciation again, so huge sediment supply, lots of alluvial fans coming down into the valleys. So the first order control is this climate of dumping the water out, and then the second order is the gravels. We have lots of individual Appalachians there. I could spend hours talking about Chile. I love the place. But we'll look at one particular one, Erzuras, which is one of my favorites. And if we go to the vineyard, we go, whoa, that doesn't look like Bordeaux at all. When's the last time you saw a palm tree in, in Bordeaux? Okay, and then you bicycle down one of the vineyards and you go, whoa, I haven't seen any cactus in Bordeaux recently. So what's going on here? Well, let's go into the vineyard. This is actually a cactus that's named after uh, the vineyard. And you can see in the distance, and I'll give you a little closer view, that straight line going across the valley. Now that's obviously not a function of so the gravel or the terroir, that's just drip irrigation. Okay? Because this is a desert, and so they have to supply water, which means they can control the availability of water. 
So it's not that you necessarily need to have drip irrigation, but you necessarily have to be able to have some control over the amount of water and when it occurs. Okay, too much water, and there's not much you can do. You can't dehydrate uh, the air. So this amount of control. And then what is coming down from the mountains? This is what the vineyard looks like. And once again, it's our gravel. And the gravel is there because even with drip irrigation, when you control putting the water on, how it percolates through the rock. If we had a much higher clay content, then we'd have absorption of water onto the outside of the clay surfaces and a different distribution of water. So again, for the millionth time, none of this is necessarily good. So having gravel or clay or particular soil is not necessarily good for wine, but it affects how the plants grow, and that's the part that's really important. Okay, and then we'll look one other thing in the Southern Hemisphere, and that's jumping over to New Zealand where we have the influence again of tectonics, erosion, and now these are fluvial gravels as opposed to alluvial gravels. Okay. If you're familiar with New Zealand, another major plate boundary, the active alpine fault, goes right through it, forming the Southern Alps. Active uplift, very, very fast uplift, and active erosion of that. And so it's the Southern Alps in the background and a fly fisherman in the middle. And you can see the gravels moving down these streams. And when the gravels get out into the relatively flat slopes away from the mountains, we have these huge gravel outwash plains that are coming fundamentally from erosion and the glaciation, but it's all been reworked by streams. And it's the site of the world's only appellation that's defined by a stratigraphic unit. So even though I mentioned that the Gunz gravel terrace in Bordeaux is really important, that's not part of the definition of, of the various appellations and sub-appellations there. For the gimlet gravels, the requirement, if you want to have gimlet gravels on the label, 95% of the production has to come from this particular gravel stratigraphic unit. And to see what that looks like, this is an aerial view, and you can see various vineyard plots, but you can also see in some of them the um, place where former river channels were as the rivers have moved back and forth. And so all these gravels are being reworked. And again, in this part of the world, it's really important that you have that gravel. And here's what the vineyard looks like. And if we do a cross section through it, you can dig down, you can see it's gravel all the way down. Okay. So I've shown you pictures intentionally that look fairly similar in Washington, California, France, Chile, and New Zealand, not because gravel is magical, but terroir is magical. And terroir is magical in the sense of what we call the Goldilocks zone. Everything has to be just right, has to be permissive to allow things to happen. And then the final step, of course, is the winemaker and what you do with it. And so that's another one of my passions. I've made wine, this is now my 40th vintage, so I've been making wine for a long time. Some of it's pretty darn good. First couple of vintages, not so much and it allowed me to talk even more about what that, that gravel does. So we return to our simple thought experiment. Okay. Nearby vineyards that produce really, really different wines, and yet everything apparently is the same. So I think you can now answer this question for why that might be. Okay. And what I do, you now know enough to go do. You can go out there and look at the physical environment. You can measure things. Okay. I haven't gone into the geochemistry of what you could measure. That's a whole other subject. And people often ask me, well, we know we can fingerprint different vineyards with you know, either trace elements or isotopic measurements, and all that's true, but none of those things affect the flavor profile of the wine. It's all about these much larger scale features that I call terroir that are affecting everything. So let me slowly wind down to the conclusion by looking at a couple other variables. And the first one is time, okay, and this is the concept of vintages. Okay, now vintages mean different things in different places. Okay, in France, vintage is really, really important. Okay, so if you go to wine stores and you have an unlimited budget, they're going to talk about different vintages and why this one's so much more expensive than that one. Actually, they're all expensive, but some, <laughs> some are even more expensive than others. Okay, and that's because in many years, the, the, the climate, the rainfall, everything wasn't perfect for producing really good stuff. So the vintage variation is huge. Whereas in a place like Chile and many parts of Washington State in Australia, the climate and the precipitation is much more uh, even, more reliable. So there's much less vintage variation and some would say there's no vintage variation. It's all about the winemaker and I was feeling really good this year and I made a really good wine. Okay, so we can 
bring this back into the terroir world and we can say, so for a particular vineyard, a certain combination of, of slope, of elevation, of sun angle, of soil types, of gravel size um, will produce really good wine. And then another year, with different amount of rainfall, different temperature, that same good terroir could be bad terroir. So again, there's nothing magical about any particular terroir, but we can measure these things. Scientifically, we can go in there, we can look at them, we can describe them, and relate them to what could be produced. Okay, and then let me end with a fairly important topic for all of us to think about, and that is climate change. Okay, you walk outside this door, we have pretty good evidence <laughs> of what's going on with climate change. And yes, I understand the difference between today's weather and long-term climate, that they're different. But I think it's very clear to most people on Earth that the climate is changing. It is getting warmer for reasons that are fairly understandable. And that is going to affect the world wine landscape. So places that now are relatively cool and marginal for viticulture, like parts of England, for example, um, will undoubtedly now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, be better. There are already, and I'm probably not supposed to say this publicly, are places in things that produce sparkling wine with bubbles in it in parts of France that are actually buying vineyards in England. Oh, sacre bleu. You would never, ever admit to that in public. Okay. <laughs> And there are places in the world that now are marginal on the hot side, on the hot dry side, parts of Spain, that will probably not be amenable to the way they currently practice viticulture. They may have to move to different grape varieties or different uh, vineyard techniques to be able to survive. But it's clear, climate change is going to move uh, areas in terms of prospectivity for producing great wine, and they're going to immediately affect the type of grapes that you can grow and will plant there. And so this we're already seeing in real time. So wineries are saying, oh, I've decided to plant more Syrah because that can handle the heat and much less Pinot Noir, just picking uh, another example. So it's going to affect the grape varieties that are grown and where you grow them. And in general, we're gonna see a trend to having more red wines produced in the world. And since I like red wine, that's not a bad thing because there are very few places that are getting cooler. And so cool weather grapes, things like, like Riesling, uh, will have a more restricted place where they will grow really well. Okay? It'll never be zero, but there's gonna be changes. And so you could predict those and map them out. So if you want more details about any of this, I refer to these two fine publications for which the editors are in this room. So we, we thank you, and particularly from Riot, who held my hand as I wrote one of these things through many, many drafts. And she said, no, Larry, that's not quite right. And so we fixed it up. So you can go and read much more about this. And at that, I'll bring it to a close to leave plenty of time for questions and for anybody to think about where they want to take me for dinner tonight to have nice wine. Thanks, Larry. It was really a very nice talk. And I'm, I'm sure the, everybody in the room thought the same way. And uh, I'm also convinced that a lot of people will have questions, whether in the room or online. Uh, in the room, there are some microphones uh, where there is a white sticker that somebody's standing next to them. So if you want to ask a question, please go to the microphone. Uh -oh. So here's a question: What, ah. what the, the role of uh, glaciers and uh, and and sediments in delivering delivering nutrients? Um, you know, I mean, that, and volcanoes, volcanoes, erosion, glaciers bring nutrients. How how does that play in? So in general, grapevines don't need very much in the way of nutrients. Okay, there are certain things which might be be poisonous, could be bad. But in general, the main things for biological activity, <coughs> which is nitrogen and phosphorus, potassium being the most important, are more than abundant enough um, from almost any substrate. 
So it's more a case of restricting access to too much nutrient at the right time. Okay? And some places will um, do a lot in terms, not necessarily fertilizers, but, but composting. But that's more to control what we call the cover crops, which is a way of controlling weeds and undesirable growth, than it is about actually getting nutrients into the plants. So controlling water is number one. The control or the influence of nutrients is a lesser important thing because the plants in almost every occurrence will have more than enough nutrients to grow what they need to grow. Another question? Yes, yeah. one. Question. One question. How do you feel, so um, how big is the influence of uh, human cultures or heritage on you know where uh, the, the the location of those uh, of of the growing like the the grapes mm -hmm. uh, in other words i mean are there places where the physical environment is great to grow uh, uh, to grow grapes mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, and there uh, and there's no grape over there okay it's a great question with about four different layers of question hidden within them <laughs> so let me go through e each one of them so the influence of civilization through millennia has been really important in terms of the, the siting of vineyards. And let me just give you a little bit of, of, of history here. We have very clear documentation of actual human production wineries going back at least eight or 9,000 years. But we have even clearer evidence of the human enjoyment of fermented beverage that we might call wine, probably not the same quality of what you're gonna get you know, in the restaurants, uh, going back into well into prehistory. So you can go into to caves in Lascaux and other places where we see mounds of grape seeds in the corner of the cave that we can date back to 50,000, 100,000 years. And you can say, well, maybe the wind just blew all those grape seeds in there. Okay, but that's not quite true. Clearly, people were picking the grapes. And why would they do that? So grapes, okay, and to, to get into a little bit of physiology, a properly ripened grape will be somewhere around 20 to 25 bricks, which is percent sugar. And there's always yeast everywhere in the air, and so the yeast will land on the grapes, and so grapes in nature will ferment naturally. Okay, and the birds know this, so when the grapes get ripe, the birds come down, and there was probably some human, maybe 200,000 years ago, um, just after they discovered fire, or maybe before they discovered fire, who saw the birds eating those grapes and then flying this strange pattern through the air. And they went, huh, I've always wanted to fly, maybe not quite like that. And they tasted some of those and they went, oh, I feel like flying now. Because the grapes were actively fermenting, not to the level of producing wine, but they were producing alcohol. And that, I would argue, is the world's first chemical equation. Sugar plus yeast is water plus CO2. So it's actually a decarbonation reaction if we start getting <laughs> geochemical. So the first part of your, your, your question is that um, the cultivation of, of vineyards and the production of wine closely parallels human civilization. Another big event in that was the way that warfare was phage uh, done a long time ago. So to greatly simplify this, you would have a big marauding army, you'd lay siege to a town for 10 or 20 years until they ran out of provisions and they gave up. So it only takes about two years to get full production from a grapevine. So the Roman legions, among other people, would take grapevines with them, plant them while they're doing siege to a particular village, and then guess what? They're in there suffering, running out of everything, and we're sitting here making wine. I mean, they're doing other things too. So the important thing about that is they took grapes from the central Mediterranean region where we have clear evidence for the earliest uh, Vetus vinifera, the, the species that we make wine from, and it basically traveled with the various uh, Greek and Roman armies and other civilizations around the world, and because they planted it there, then we had an active ongoing experiment. Did it prosper? And where it prospered, we now say, oh yes, Riesling in Germany does really well. Well, they probably planted everything that they brought from, from Turkey and Greece there, and the Riesling did really well. And when they were in Spain and the Ottoman Turks came in, then the hot weather grapes. So that was the part of the distribution of those grapes around. 
And then another part of your question has to do with, with sort of the legislation of Appalachian and, and cultural heritage. Many places, uh, particularly I'll come back to, to Bordeaux, have very strict legal requirements that if you want to have this name on the label, you have to have uh, certain farming practices, you have to use certain grapes and greatly simplify it. If you're on the left bank, it's dominantly Cabernet Sauvignon. If you're on the right bank, it's dominantly Merlot. And then in each commune, they have different ones, but there's about a dozen different what we call blending grapes, Petit Verdot, Carbonara, Merlot, and that will be legally described. This is what you have to use, these percentage of these grapes, if you want to use that appellation. So if you want to call it Graves de saint Million, you have to do those things. There are people who say, I could make a much better wine with a different percentage of grapes, and they can't do it legally. So these are the garagerices, the people who are making wine in their garage, so to speak. And because they're not following the exact legal requirements, they can't use the official name for it, even though they would argue, and many people would argue, they're producing better wine than using if they'd followed that. So you're part of the, the question about sort of cultural and sort of legal um, framing of the question of wine um, is really important and varies from around the world. Thank you. Uh, is there another question Thank here? You very Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I would like to know your opinion about reliability of soil geochemical data related grape wine origin identification. Um, so it's, it's quite reliable. Um, there's many papers. I thought about going into that part of it but it, it, it gets very technical in a hurry. But it's, it's very easy to fingerprint um, either by trace elements, and usually you do some level of factor analysis to identify which suite of elements is useful for fingerprinting a particular grape. And in some cases, various isotopic uh, tracers are also very useful. So yes, absolutely, we can do that. We can prove that this wine came from that part of, of the world. The reason why I didn't go into it very much at all here is that it has zero impact upon wine quality, which was sort of the main topic. But yes, you can absolutely trace things geochemically. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is a last question. Yes, a very short one, but there is already Bordeaux Blanc, white Bordeaux. Mm -hmm and uh, red Bordeaux, of course. So uh, in the end, you said that uh, some ter terroirs, they will have to change and mm -hmm. uh, change from white to red, for example. So why do we only have uh, Bordeaux Blanc and even Bourgogne Blanc? Mm -hmm. As you see, I'm French. Yep. <laughs> uh, quite simply, they are grown in slightly different places. Okay? Nobody is pulling up the vines in saint Million to plant white grape varieties. Not that you couldn't do it, you, you, you could do it, okay? And obviously, Sautern, Chateau Yaquim, is one of the world's most famous, not to mention expensive wines, and you're not going to suddenly start planting red grapes there, not that they wouldn't grow. So you can do it, and as climate changes, exactly where you might want to have those and the boundaries, that will change as well. And there's that cultural thing that he referred to over there. Let's just say some cultures don't change as quickly as others. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's the last question is from uh, somebody remote. Uh, so, and then we, we stop the, the Q&A session. Uh, so the question is, what about the microbiome, soil biome affecting or changing the terroir absolutely. in conjunction to the geology? Yes, absolutely. That's another whole part. In the two papers I referred to, um, I went into that in much more detail. So it's, it's very, very important. So we're really talking about a whole ecological system. And for obvious reasons, I had to limit it to, to one part of it. As an example, um, there are two different strains of bacteria that are very well known. Uh, they shorten it as Brett, Brettomycetes, um, that gives you a very strong flavor that could be described as barnyard or musty forest floor, all those sort of things. And in many wines, it's a very positive attribute, especially if you like those flavors. And it's actually due to contamin contamination. I don't want to use that word because that has a, a, a conjurative uh, meaning. Um, but yes, the, the biological um, biome of the soil is, is really important. And we could go into that as well. And it should be obvious that you'll have a different ecology in those gravel layers 
than you will in a more clay-rich layers. So all that comes into it. I was simplifying it as just looking at grain size because I can show you a picture of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to applaud the speaker, and uh, now he's going to go for lunch. <laughs>